the Protestant service at the Maxwell Chapel uh, base there. He says, I am really blessed to have a good chapel team here at the Fort Second that works very well together. They've been a blessing to me as I'm getting acclimated to chaplain's duty. And he says, thank you all for your prayers, words of encouragement and support throughout the process, and especially while I'm away. Word of warning, he says, behave yourself. <laughs> behave yourself. I'm telling you, behave yourself. He says, or at least clean up all the remnants of wild parties at church. <laughs> I guess that's probably the fault, right? <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean. And he's joking as well. So he says, I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Any questions? Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, by your spirit you brought Emperor Constantine to believe and to confess the victory of the cross and moved his mother to help in the building of many churches where your people could gather to receive your gifts and praise your name. Receive our thanks for them and for all the benefactors who give generously of their wealth to further the work of your church in spreading the saving gospel. Through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Today we're going to cover Helena, the mother of Constantine. But before that, I chose Genesis chapters 25 and 27, the story of Rebecca and Jacob. Now, I'll, I'll give you... Uh, I'll give you a foot sniper here. You see the picture? You're going to see a couple more like that, and then I'll be telling you about the picture at the end of the presentation, either today or next week. Okay? We'll talk about the Bible background of Genesis chapter 25 and 27. We'll talk some, if we get to it, the background of Helena, her legacy in the church, and I always have the rest of the story. And if you're, you have your uh, Saint book with you, it's on pages 84 and 85, and both Constantine and Helena are on the same day, which I believe is May 21st. Okay. Turning to Bible study, Genesis chapter 25, the story of Rebecca and Jacob. Now, you see the picture? It's a painting. I'll be in. What's it show? Who's this guy here? Any idea? He's a great patriarch of the church. Not Abraham. Isaac. This is Isaac in his old age. And this young man here is Jacob. And there's a little a little subterfuge going on here that we'll talk about. Alright. Who was Rebecca? She's not in the painting. But who was Rebecca in Scripture? Jacob's wife, okay, the mother of twins, Esau and Jacob. And there's a story wrapped up in that whole relationship there. So how's the story of Isaac and Rebecca like Abraham? So let's take a look at it. And I have links to slides with the, uh, the words here to make it a little bit easier so everybody can, can look at it. In addition to... Uh, looking it up in your own Bible. Genesis 25, verses 19 to 21a. You would like to read that for me? These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was four years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padaram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer to respect his wife and seed. So how are Jacob and Isaac and Rebecca, how is that all tied to being like Abraham and Sarah? Both wives were barren. Now, Rebecca wasn't quite as old as Sarah was. But nevertheless, it took an intervention by the Lord for her to have children. What happened when Rebecca did become pregnant? This is where the story begins. Verses 21 
29 to 21 when? I got the wrong one. Hang on. Hang on. I got the wrong link in here. My bad. Someone read uh, 25 verses 20, 31 to 33. I have the wrong link. My, my, my problem. 25, 31 to 33. Okay. Is that 19 to 21? Oh, I'm sorry. I all right, I work very hard on this, I'll tell you. Right, I got it messed up. Yeah, there we go. We do that. But yeah, I have to pray to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was married. The Lord answered his prayer. His wife was actually pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. And she said, Why is this happening in this way? So she went to the choir of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people are from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out was red, and his whole body was like a burning blood. So they called him two boys. And after this, his brother came out with his hand wrapped with his mouth still, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was the six years old, and he was Okay, you okay. have the scenario there? She couldn't understand what was going on during her gestation period. There was something going on in her womb. And the Lord said, don't worry about it. This is part of my plan, that one will be stronger than the other, and one will rule the other. Aha! That's the whole crux of the uh, Bible passage. And when they were born, Esau was first. They were fraternal brothers, twins. He was first. Jacob was second. And how did they, what was the circumstances when they were born? Esau was delivered first. But Jacob coming second, what was he doing? He was holding on to Esau's ankle or foot. That's quite a quite a, a, a thought if you, if you look right at it. How could that happen? But it did. So the Lord answered Rebecca that there would be something going on in her life with her two boys there. So who was the firstborn? Esau. What did that entitle the firstborn in that day? He had the birthright. He would be the first inheriting. If not all things, at least the very best things. Okay? One day Esau, coming in from the field, saw Jacob. Now Esau was a hunter. Jacob was more of a, a home, you know, a uh, person staying around his father's house, working with his mother. So what did he ask of Jacob? This is great. Yeah, he says, once when Jacob was cooking stew, or porridge, as you can be translated either way, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. And therefore his name was called Edom. Okay, so there's a connection here, Edom being east of the Jordan River later on, and the children of Israel's life. Okay, so he traded that for a meal. All right, what did he promise? Esau? Uh, what did Esau trade for his meal? His birthright. Now, was he really serious about that? Probably not. It was a real off the cuff. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. I'll give you my birthright, whatever. And he had this bill, and he went on with his life, never thinking again that it was something that was going to trouble him for the rest of his life. But it tied back to 
what the Lord had told Rebecca. That one would be the dominant of the other. And it wouldn't be necessarily the way of birth to birth uh, in sequence there. Okay? Now, Rebecca heard Isaac uh, when he asked for a meal. So later on, Isaac asked Esau for a meal. He said, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, and my soul may bless you before I die. Ah, Rebecca's standing at the kitchen <coughs> nearby, and she hears this promise of Isaac to Esau. So Esau goes on his errand, and then Rebecca does something. What does she do? So we did one, 27, 5 to 10. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food, that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats, so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. Uh -huh. That he may bless you before he dies. So there's a little subterfuge going on here. Rebecca knows full well that Esau is firstborn, and it's his birthright. And it wasn't anyone else's place to receive the blessing from the father. But Esau was already out on errand. So she says, well, rather than going hunting, go get something out of, out of the stable, the corral, whatever, and you prepare it, take it to his, uh, to uh, Isaac then. Okay? There was a little bit of subterfuge here as well. How did Rebecca, Rebecca <laughs> respond to Jacob's objection to her plot? Jacob said to his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is what? A hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. Now, you have to connect that back to what the Lord said to Rebecca when she was expecting the two boys. That one would be dominant over the other. And here she says, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm telling you what to do. If there's any repercussions, it's on me, not on you. Let the curse be on me. Okay? So there's something more has to go on. If Isaac is a smooth, fair, complected young man, and Esau is a ruddy, complected, airy young man, and also, also is an outdoorsman. So she has to do one or two things. First, she gets some lamb's wool and put it on the back of your hands and around your forearms. And then go get some clothing out of your brother's closet. Okay? Put on his clothing so that not only will Isaac feel the hairy part on your hand and your forearm, but he will smell the outdoorsy smell on your brother's cloak that you're wearing. And because he is almost blind now, he will not know the difference, and he didn't. So Jacob brought the meal in, gave it to Isaac, he ate, he blessed Jacob. Now, is that the real end of the story? No. 
Esau comes back. And what does he do? He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Father, let me rise, or let my father arise and eat of his son's being, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. And you can hear the melodramatic music, you know. You know, you know, like they do in the movies or whatever. No, you know, the, 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 uh, the turning point of the story, right here. This is it. Ta -da! As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But Isaac said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Now, did Jacob take Esau's birthright? Not really. Esau kind of flippantly gave it away, but he definitely cheated Esau with Rebecca's help out of his blessing. And that made a division in the whole family. Okay? That's the Bible background of a family and the dynamics of a family. I wanted to uh, uh, show you as we look at Helena and Constantine over the next two weeks. Okay? Notice the, 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 the picture again. Okay? Work on it. This uh, is a rather busy map, but I wanted to show you in a couple things. At Constantine's time, or right before it, the Roman Empire was beginning to fragment. No longer was Caesar in Rome the master over everything. You can see how big the Roman Empire was. And the legions were spread out from all the way up into uh, Britain, so that this was one region. This was another down here. This was a third, and this was a fourth. And they were called tetrarchies. Tetra meaning four. So there were actually four parts of the empire at that time. And at one point, right before Constantine, his father, was one of the tetrarchs of the uh, uh, Asiana Pontic uh, Oriens. The, the purple down here was down here. In fact, was born here in Nicomedia. Helena was born here in Nicomedia. And Constantine itself was born in Nicomedia. All right. Helena. She was born in Asia Minor, Bithynia, in Nicomedia, circa AD 246 and 248. Her name on Roman coins of her era was Flavia Helena or Flavia Julia Helena. She came from, this is important for the story, she came from what were considered the lower classes of the region. And even her name talks about, in essence, she was a stable maid. Now that has all kinds of connotations. Okay? It can mean everything from a concubine to a prostitute to simply a person of low estate. But that's where she kind of came from. Not upper thrust, like you expect for a guy that's going to be Caesar of the whole Roman Empire. But nevertheless, Constantius met her in 270, and he considered her his soulmate. The story goes that when they met, they both were wearing silver arm amulets that were to the same god or whatever. And from that he decided, or he felt that she was his soulmate. So Constantius would later become emperor. And so he married, uh, or at least took under his wing, maybe as a concubine, it's hard to tell, uh, Helena. They had a son in uh, 272 on 27 February. It's interesting, you know, the date and the, the month, but not necessarily the year. <laughs> the, the, the dates are all over the place in that sense. Even though this is uh, the, the, the third century, history was not as 
as regimented as we have history today. Constantius, when he later moved from Asia Minor over to Rome, he wound up divorcing, or at least sending into exile Helena around 289 after they moved to Rome. Why? Well, she was considered not upper crust enough, not sophisticated enough, whether it was because of her looks or she dressed less than a wealthy uh, a woman or whatever, but maybe because of where she came from. So she just definitely did not fit there. So Constantius sent her away back to Nicomedia in Asia Minor, and she lived there with Constantine, their son, for a number of years. So they were exiled to uh, Nicomedia. Her son Constantine was proclaimed Augustus, or emperor, when his father Constantius died in 306. Right? Constantine restored Helena, his mother, to prominence when he brought her back to the imperial court in Rome in 312. So she was exiled for about 20 years, and then she was brought back by her son. When Helena became a Christian is uncertain in, the, in all the histories. But it happened sometime either right before or right after she came back to Rome. Now we know when Paul went to Rome that he was uh, hopeful of establishing the church in Rome. And even in Caesar's palace, there were Christians at that time when Paul and Peter came to Rome. And they continued to grow more or less behind the scenes in house churches and things like this, but they weren't fully recognized and they were even persecuted up until this time. But both Helena and Constantine there's indisputable proof that they both were solid Christians. They both were solid Christians by 312. AD 326 to 328, Helena undertook her trip to Syria, Palestine, and Jerusalem with her son's blessing and support. And that's part of the, the story, part of her legacy. Her goal was to discover the major sites of Jesus' ministry. Anyone been to Jerusalem? Brett. You have, okay, you have. All right. What's the church where Jesus was born in Bethlehem? The church of the nativity, right? Now, there's also where he was crucified, which is the church of the holy, or buried, the holy sepulchre. Okay? Because the Romans had leveled Golgotha and built a shrine there. And then... Constantine and his mother had the shrine taken down, and they built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Also down in the Sinai Peninsula, there is a monastery built on what they thought was the real Mount Sinai, and that's the monastery of St. Catherine, Catherine, down there in the uh, uh, Sinai Peninsula. So she went about trying to find where the holy places of Jesus' ministry were. And most of them had, were easy to find in a sense, they mostly had pagan temples or shrines built on top of them. So find one of those and you go, oh yeah. It's kind of like in Ohio when you have uh, these funny round top mounds out in the middle of the field. Okay? If you're a farmer, you dare not touch one of those. Because what are they? <coughs> More than More than They're burial sites. The mound people that inhabited South Central and Southwestern Ohio, they built burial sites in these big mounds where they had living places nearby. So you find one of those, you can't touch it because until you get the archaeologists in here to find out whether there's anything Native American in there. The sites were the same thing, although you could tear one down because only under Constantine were Christians formally recognized. And he passed laws that did away with the purges and persecution of Christians in his reign in Rome. The first emperor to do so. He couldn't be persecuted. He couldn't be crucified. He couldn't be imprisoned for being a believer. In fact, he endorsed formal churches at that time, given the fact that he built at least five of them that I can find in 
Syria and Palestine at that time. Eleanor was the one who went and found him on her, her pilgrimage, and then he endorsed him and he built him. So she came back, or was on her way back, stopped at Nicomedia where she perished uh, at uh, the age of 80 years old. And uh, also, only a couple of weeks before, Constantine you know, died there at Nicomedia. <coughs> All right. Eleanor's legacy, another one of those pictures. The rest of us are right. She was, she was a leading figure in helping Christians gain the notable standing that had been denied them for centuries after the death and resurrection of Jesus. She aided in the quest to identify the important Christian sites in the Holy Land, and she ported, supported her son's leadership as the first Christian emperor. She encouraged and supported her son's conversion to Christianity. And I think that's I think she was first, and then she made sure that he converted at that point. The rest of the story. You see the picture? There's a foot snapper, okay? Why all the paintings of Helena with a cross? A cross. You know, there's another one here. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them quite online. Any ideas? Did she find the true prophet? Pardon? Did she find the true prophet? Exactly what Chris said. She was in Jerusalem scouting places of note with Jesus' ministry, and she was pointed to a sister. Sister, you know what that is? An underground chamber with, for water, right? It had three crosses in it that had been hidden away for many, many years. And she was told that those were the three crosses from Christ. Jesus' crucifixion. Well, which was which? She wanted to know which was Jesus. The story goes, and it's, it's only legend, I, I can't I can't attest to it. But the story goes that they found a lady in Jerusalem who had been sick for many, many years, to the point of almost dying. And uh, they brought the lady and she touched one cross, nothing happened. She touched the second cross, nothing happened. She touched the third cross. And she's healed. And she knew that was the cross. Well, I don't think she brought the whole cross back to Rome or anywhere near it, but she brought a substantial part of it back with her. And if you if you know what Martin Luther said uh, when he visited Rome on his uh, pilgrimage, he found that so many splinters of cross that you could fill St. Peter's about with all the splinters of the cross. But nevertheless, <laughs> she is the one who is credited with finding the true cross of Christ. And there are still relics around. Uh, same thing goes with thorns. The story goes that she found or was shown a thorn, a crown of thorns. And uh, Luther said the same thing. There are more thorns than you could ever, you know, invent. So that was one of two. Bottom line, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, and the Anglican Communion revere her as a saint, and the Lutheran Church commemorates her. An important difference there, okay? They pray to her, and we simply commemorate her. Okay? That's Helena and her legacy, and I gave her Rebecca and uh, Jacob, and that whole story behind there, and there's a lot of the, the uh, subterfuge and other things that are part of uh, that story. Uh, and then, by uh, Helen. Next week, Pastor is going to begin or continue his psalm study. Uh, he did last week. The 30th of uh, July, I'll do Constantine. And then Pastor Whitty returns on the 6th. Any questions? These are people that are real people, and I don't, you can see that there are real lives that are involved here. And uh, the legacy that Helena left us was she was instrumental in her son becoming a Christian and becoming their first Christian emperor. Okay? Influences of a good mom. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. No further questions? Let's pray then. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise your name for all the many saints that have 
persevered over the ages who have brought us your word and preserved your word in truth and purity for us and taken away persecution from us. We thank you for their lives and their witness to us. And today as we come together to celebrate uh, together the installation of our principal, Scott Ferguson, we join you in thanking for we join in thanking you for the blessing of this fellowship today. We pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Amen. Let there be fellowship. <laughs>